And we're live. <laughs> Welcome everybody. Hope you're doing well. There's a few folks here already. I'm just going to adjust the audio. I can see that it looks a little bit on the hot side. Let's bring this down. Got a big old loud voice here. If there's any clipping or distortion, let us know. I'm back in the studio. <laughs> Trying something different today. I can actually share the laptop with you. If you, you know, if someone brings up a guitar we want to look up or an amp or whatever, at least we'll now be able to see the screen. So hopefully this works. And uh, welcome back, everybody. Thanks for joining in. We've got Steve here. How you doing? Dwight Bailey's here already. How you doing? We haven't talked about guitars enough. How about today? That we stick to accordions. You might be right. You might be right. Let's let's switch it up. We'll talk about fiddles and accordions. That's good. Actually, speaking of which, I'll tell you something kind of uh, a little bit funny later. Something I ordered that you're going to hear appear on the channel from time to time. That you might not expect. Maybe, maybe you will. I don't know. Maybe I already mentioned it. I can't remember. All right. Welcome, everybody. We've got uh, Cowhide Musics here. How you doing? And before we get going, let's pop out this chat and I'll enlarge it so I can read it easy. Here we go. This is good. This makes life a bit easier. All right. So my chat is here today. My mic's over here. It's a bit of a mess. <laughs> it's a bit of a last minute rush to to move things back into this room, but uh, hopefully it's all right. Um, yeah, if the microphone's distorting at all, just let us know. It looks kind of hot on the signal over here, but uh, yeah, I guess if no one's complaining, it should be good. I, I can't stand poor audio. And just to let you know too, the, all the live streams now, you can listen back to them, obviously on YouTube, but I've connected my iTunes back from years ago. That's finally connected. And Spotify too. So if you just want to listen to the audio, you can check it out on those platforms after the fact as well. Usually it takes about a day before I get it onto those. I just have to get the audio, you know, and then do the uh, website thing that posts it out to everywhere. But um, yeah, there you go. All right, welcome everybody. John Smith, uh, he says, good day all, finally catching a live stream. Welcome to the live stream. I started doing these a bit more on a regular basis. The next one will probably still be the same day, but I'm gonna bump it to a different time of the day just to Keep it interesting. It's cool doing them at the same time because people know what time it comes up, but it doesn't always work for everybody. So we'll see how that goes. Hey, Don er Erickson, welcome, man. He says, hello from the US, one of the members. Thank you for uh, signing up. All right. HL Cotton's here from North Carolina. Awesome, awesome. All right, great. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for the confirmation on the... The audio setup, every time I try a different mic or move things around, it's a, it can sometimes not work very well, but we'll see how we go. Banjos, uh, Cowhide says he's got two. That's very cool. Jody says, I have a PV Delta Blues. You showed feedback that happens even without, even without even being plugged in. How did you fix it? Oh, so yeah, that reverb fault was just a, it was just a bad circuit, I'm pretty sure. And they all had it. It's just one of those problems. I actually had the amplifier completely replaced and the next one did it. It took a lot of back and forth. Basically, I took it back to the shop. They told me there was nothing wrong with it. So eventually after troubleshooting it and trying all of these different, I actually even try, changed the reverb tank to an Accutronics one. And it still had the same problem. I was like, something's not right. So it had something to do, I think from what I've read online about the physical circuit just being really dodgy in those amps. Um, you can get away with it if you turn the reverb down below 12 o'clock, but those amps don't have a lot of reverb, and I like a bit of reverb, so 12 o'clock really isn't that high. It's kind of like 9 o'clock on a Fender amp, um, and the louder you go, the worse the feedback gets. So, yeah, after replacing the... After I had the amp replaced, I sold it. I was like, I'm done, and that was the last PV amp I ever owned. In terms of um, new stuff, I bought PV Bandits after that that we used, but... Uh, yeah, I like that amp too. It's a real shame. Like the prior version I had years before that never had that problem. So they either skimped on parts or they just had a faulty component, which it's kind of like how Fender worked with their Blues Juniors. They had a massive problem with their reverb tanks in one particular series. I think it was the three series, um, but that's been sort of fixed now on the fours. So yeah, you just get bugs like that. I'm less reluctant now to try them than ever. I, I'm just not that interested. Or more reluctant, I should say, not less. Yeah, I'm not interested. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's a bit of a bummer because they're cool amps. 
Um, what's the difference between a banjo and a trampoline? <laughs> Answer, you take your shoes off to jump on a trampoline. <laughs> that sounds like a harmonica joke as well, right? Best noise of harmonic. No, what's the what's the joke about harmonicas? If you want to play 18 holes, <laughs> go play golf. I always like that one. That's shout out to my friend Neil who told me that. All right, we've got Steve from Alabama. How you doing? All right, cool. People from everywhere here. Jose from uh, Los Angeles. Welcome. We've got Dwight Bailey's here. How you doing, man? All right, so we've taken some questions today and. Same old thing, talk a bit of, a little bit about guitars and amps and pedals and whatever else. If anyone else has any questions or YouTube stuff, whatever. So um, you might have noticed recently I've started breaking out the Little Crow guitar again, the black guitar that everyone seems to be wondering what it is. I've had that guitar for maybe seven years. I'm not exactly sure when I first got it, but it's, uh, it's back, packed away, I think. It's actually in this gig bag, but great guitar. Uh, mini humbucker in the neck pickup, tally bridge pickup, sort of 50s profile neck made in, made in Perth in Western Australia here. Super cool guitar, one of the best I've owned. But every time I played it, a lot of people would be like, oh, I wish you just used a guitar we know. And so I stopped using it on videos for some reason. Um, I'm like, you know what, screw that. I'm just gonna start playing all of the guitars again on videos. And, and I was so good going back to it. If you missed the Chicalis Audio Works one or however you say it, Chicalis, I think some people are pronouncing it, then, um, Go check it out. It's a it's a killer guitar. So that's from Little Crow Guitars. Octopus here says, I haven't even finished paying off my Kiesel and I want to put in an order for another one. They're so good. Like, I got a video coming up of this amplifier right behind me, this Hagerman amp. Oh, the Kiesel and that, it's, it's a pretty special combination. I, I totally get it. I didn't know anything about Kiesel guitars. I always thought they were like metal players guitars, which is fine. So they weren't on my radar. Now I know that they got Johnny Highland on board and there's a lot of players that are sort of outside of that genre of playing some of those instruments and they're not as pointy as they used to be. Um, yeah, super cool. Very good quality, like right up there with the custom shop stuff, but not as expensive, you know, from other brands. But still made in the US, built really well. I know a lot of people uh, don't, or they love to hate on brands and own it. I know there's been some backstory with that guy, but man, his guitars are kick ass. They're really good. Which guitar has a, oh sorry, which guitar is a better HHS player Stratocaster? Power Ferro or Hollow Body 2? Um, so you might need to, oh hang on, oh Hollow Body 2, oh sorry, I got you now. I think you're asking me which one was better between two different strats. So you're asking me whether or not you should get a player series strat or a Hollow Body 2 SE PRS. It's up to you. <laughs> It's playing both if you can. If you can't play them both, yeah, you, it's it's a I, it's hard to recommend one over the other because they're completely different. It's like saying, should I buy a three three five or a or a Telecaster? It's like, well, what are you into? So, I would say, generally speaking, there's a pretty big generalization that the the player series or made in Mexico strats on the most part are bulletproof. So if you're buying it used or you're getting it sent from somewhere. There should be less issues with that overall, but the PRS stuff's pretty solid. I, I've just found some of them a little hit and miss from that range, depending on where they're made. But general, I, I mean, I own one and I, I really like my PRS SE, but I don't have a, a hollow body one. I've got the Custom 24 and I think that's a great guitar. Uh, but two completely separate ones. There's no really like which one's better. It's like, what do you prefer playing? Do you, do you want like a humbucker guitar or, or not? Um, I know you did say HSS, but you still got the pickups are completely different in the other two positions. So yeah, it's a, it's a little bit of a tricky question to answer. They're both pretty solid instruments. If you're at all interested in the neck strat sound, that should make it really easy. But if you're only interested in humbucker tones, I would say probably go for the PRS. That would be the easiest way to answer that. Best semi-affordable blues breaker pedal clone. You know, I got to test one from a company out of Mexico that were called the, oh, they made two pedals. They made the, hang on, let's, let's have a look. It's the benefit of this, I can just look it up. Um, MCG pedals make a really good blues breaker clone. That's who they are. Uh, the blues, what, what was it called? The, oh, 
man, so bad with pedal names lately. I, I review them and then I, I don't often recall them that easily after I finish the video. I'm like, I just sort of like, it must just disappear from my memory. But they're great pedals if you're looking for that blues breaker sound. I know, um, oh, where is it? That's the Levitico. Where's the other one? Um, oh, it's called the Genesis. If you can find the MCG Genesis, that's a pretty good one. If that's too expensive, there's other options out there. Um, you can buy like a Marshall Blues Breaker pedal, one of those version twos for next to nothing online. I mean, it, you could get them even used for a bit of a deal. So have a look for those. You might not even need to necessarily get a clone. I'll just pop the chat back up. Man, I tell you what, sometimes this all works and other times nothing pops back up. Where's the chat? All right, here we go. All right, I'm gonna crack open one of these. Chess Roots Love says, and miss all your cool posters. <laughs> Is that it being in this room or being in the other room? Yeah, these are uh, a good mix of like random stuff. I got now the 80s kind of weird synth wavy vibe over here and horror movie stuff and some of the Mark Knopfler and 80s posters along the bottom. Then it goes kind of weird, horror movies and Rob Zombie at the top. And then all the sort of root stuff on this side with the exception of Ash versus Evil Dead <laughs> right over there. So I don't know, it's a weird combination of stuff, but it's better than just having all musicians. I, I actually want to sort of redo this at some point, but I don't know how much longer I'll be at this house. I probably will only be here for maybe eight months. I'm tipping somewhere around there before I get out of here. But um, so it kind of limits what I can do with the room. But the posters work. It's just, you know, something a bit different. All right. Hey, we've got Greg's Kitchen here. Welcome, man. Thanks for your comment on the, uh, on the channel. And also, well done on your channel too. You're killing it, man. Good stuff. Brought a new bass amp from Marketplace. Uh, the guy selling it was a bass player from Wolf from Wolf Wolf Mother. Far out! I can't talk today. That's awesome. They're a, they were a huge band. I don't know if they're still. Are they still playing? I have a feeling they kind of like they just stopped. Right? I could be out of the out of the loop with that. But yeah, very cool, mate. Nice stuff. Um, ben says, "Dude, I forgot about that Corvino." I uh, nearly bought one from them a while back when you were playing them. It's a great guitar. You know, I had two. I had another one that was like, uh, it was called a Raven. It was a dual humbucker guitar. I've mentioned this before, but it got lost in shipping. So uh, it, it, that was the end of that one. But the Corvino, I'm, I'm thankful that wasn't the one that, that went missing. I would have been devastated. It's uh, right up my alley, that guitar. Uh, John says, I started a 90s, 2000s pub cover band recently. Uh, we play my local bar regularly in... Uh, and sound decent in my opinion don't have any connections beyond that though uh, any advice on finding more gigs yeah so looking for gigs takes effort you don't they don't just show up unless you're part of some other multi-band thing and there's other people there from other venues or whatever the case may be so um my suggestion is try and record your band whether you set up one camera or set up a Zoom recorder, or just do something. If you can get a multi-track recording done, do it once you're tidy and you you know you say you play uh, pretty tidy now. So get something and just play the hits and then just give it out. Go to places and say, here, have a listen to this, or email them a file or a link to somewhere and say, hey, we're a band from this area. These are our songs, uh, put us in. That's all it takes. Like I used to get gigs doing that back in the day. Like I used to have a lot of printed CDs. I've finally ditched them all now because no one wants CDs anymore. But you've just got to go out and do it. I used to go venue to venue and just drop them off. Getting gigs is a lot more work than people think it is. But the great news is once you get that network, it's easy to get them from then because then you can just call up or they'll call you, which is always a good thing too. So um yeah that you've just got to get out there but you got to have something to show for it so an online presence of some description you know there's free options out there you're better off having your own website get a wordpress website put all your songs and whatever else into your own media player on that site it's a bit of a learning curve but 
You can do it that way, or you can just use a free service. There's plenty of those like Reverb Nation kind of things. I, I don't necessarily like those. They, they suck you into a platform that where only musicians are commenting on musicians, but if you use it to promote your band for venues, that will really help. You can just send them a link, send the traffic there, and you'll be good to go. So um, that that's kind of what I used to do, <laughs> and that's what I would recommend as well. All right. We've got uh, Renato from uh, Switzerland. Uh, thank you for sharing your knowledge and humor. Hey, you're welcome. No worries. Uh, Octopus Ears says, yeah, I definitely like me some Kiesel. I got the uh, Delos and I want to order a Vanquish, but I've owned about a dozen of them. Yeah, it's surprising just how popular they're getting. Like, I don't know if it was just because they reached out to other channels that weren't necessarily just metal channels, but everyone who's heard my white Kiesel in person with the Johnny Highland pickups, they're all like, man, that's got a really special sound. It's got this kind of really great, I call it the 3D pickup sound. They just they sound completely different to like a strat or a tally they're a great mix of both but just they've got their own sort of cut in the mix very cool guitars um ben says how's the knee going back into training uh hard again i am yeah i'm doing all the training again so i train at least three times a week i i split it up in a way that works for me and it also is time efficient that way as well but when i'm there i i go for it it's uh it's been good Knee's, knee's fine, by the way. It's responded well to coming back to doing... Well, walking was fine, and that, that kind of got there pretty quickly, but you realised... I realised, like, how long I'd left getting my knee fixed, and it didn't do any favours for my quads, but even they've responded pretty well last few months, so we'll see how we go. <laughs> um, all right, we've got... Uh, any way to make a strat body lighter? Yeah, not really. I mean, look, you could potentially uh, route out some cavities sort of parallel to the pickup cavities or, or along... No, not parallel to the pickup cavities, parallel to the top and bottom of the body. So if it's laying flat, you could route out some sections, but I wouldn't do that. It's just probably better getting a lighter guitar. Not all strats are super heavy, but... A lot of them are, unfortunately. They get much lighter the more you spend, which is kind of a bit of a, a crap thing. But um, there's other brands out there too, like Vola, that make much lighter guitars that are, you know, some people would argue are just as good. So, yeah. Switching up the rooms, I am. That's from Surferby. Back in this room today, I thought I'd give it a go. <laughs> yeah, a few people said uh, the other room's good, but... Uh, I much prefer that other room just in terms of like comfort. It's set up much better than this room for doing live streaming. So we'll, we'll use this one today and I'll probably switch it back. Actually, the, the reality of that room right now is I got stuff everywhere. I was shooting a review video um, for something else and the desk is pretty much covered in camera equipment. So <laughs> yeah, it was a lot easier just to come in here, set up, well, move this little crappy desk in here and set up. Keep playing that little crow on videos and it'll become a gu guitar they know. Well, that's it. Yeah, it was kind of like, I kind of understood it too because if people don't know a guitar in a video and they're trying to get a sense of how something sounds, it can be a bit, you know, like, is it the guitar that's just doing this or what's the, you know, what's the story? So, uh, yeah, it's such a great instrument. It really is. Um, how do you have your Strat trim on a Modern 2 post arrangement floating or hard down? So anytime I use a whammy bar on any guitar, I have it so when I bend any note up hard, it doesn't move. I want it to move only when I actually push down on the whammy bar. Same PRS, same for the Strat. I don't use those things that much, but when I do, I actually want to use them with force rather than having the internet, like having the bends go all over the place. So um, I would hard tail it down with four springs on a Strat and then basically have it to the point where you're up on the, like the 15th fret, you're bending the E and G strings really hard and you don't really want to see it move. And that's when I know it's set up right for me. Some people won't want that, but if you don't, you tend to get like really bad feel. It, the bends just feel completely 
just unplayable in my opinion if you're bending and then the trim's moving at the same time you don't know it's unpredictable so yeah it's up to you i mean look everyone likes to play differently and if you're not doing a whole lot of bends you might not, not need to do that but the kind of stuff that i do I, I can't have it move it just it's too unreliable octopus says underrated band wolf mother yeah yeah that's super cool they're a bit like um like a modern version of uh of led zeppelin the singer right like that kind of the whole even sort of like the the riffs and that though they, they were pretty cool i don't know if this like i said i don't know if it's still touring or not but all right we got uh m shannon welcome kiesel was part of the us uh catalog only company called carvin now kiesel does all of carvin's guitars carvin is still producing amplifiers oh cool well there you go yeah i heard they basically bought them out or something like that but um those amps you can still find them used quite often it's it's pretty cool i'd like to actually play one again i did try one live once but i'd love to try one here in the studio and then you know have it for a bit longer i only got to quickly plug into one but yeah very cool amps um and uh yeah thanks for joining the channel memberships too guys i appreciate it we've got uh lawrence from alaska another member thank you mate uh I was watching some of your older demos today. I'd like you to see, I'd like to see you bust out some Midnight Oil riffs. Still love that band. Saw them at Red Rocks in the late 80s. Very cool. Yeah, I don't play a lot of that sort of stuff. Um, I don't do a lot of cover stuff on the channel, mostly because of copyright. You know, everyone's whinging about copyright because they're playing cover band, uh, cover music of things. I, I just try to stay away from it. But um, Rick's the guy to do all that kind of stuff. He's He's the master of playing basically um of you know all the riffs so next time he's over we'll 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 see if we can stump him would you place a tune i know i'm not really set up for any of that right now unfortunately i got none of my amps are on it's a it's all a bit of a mess but uh yeah there's more videos coming up especially like we've got a jam clip coming up as well so it's in it's all cut i just haven't uploaded it yet Actually, it'll be part of that will be in this amp video coming up. Stay tuned for that. All right, we've got Zach here. Welcome, mate. What's my favorite pre-gig meal or post-gig? Uh, you know what? I never really thought too much about like all of that kind of stuff. I've, I guess it's really easy to eat poorly um, when it comes to like gigs and all that kind of stuff, but. Um, you know, I, I think if I had to pick something that I would eat after a gig, it would have to be a big fan of like a kebab or something like that. Those those um, souvlakis or whatever. Super cool. And uh, Paolo, thank you so much for the for the super chat too, mate. I, I appreciate that. But uh, yeah, unfortunately, the room, it, it's not really set up right now for, for just breaking out. I don't even have my practice amp set up. Next time. Next time. This, I'll eventually have this set up so I don't have to keep moving things. I can just go, okay, it's on and it'll go. That's that's the dream. Um, but thanks again, mate. I appreciate it. Uh, you should remind people of your cam camera channel and websites every now and then. I prefer not to, actually. I don't want people subscribing to other stuff where they don't watch anything. It's kind of not a smart move uh, for, for doing this kind of stuff. I want like organic traffic and a separate audience. Or if there's crossover, fair enough, but I don't really like um, promoting things that aren't related to this, you know, music on this channel. It just doesn't make sense. You just get a lot of dead subs is what they call it. It's not really something I'm into. That channel I, I'd rather have for people who are more into that kind of stuff than support me but just because, you know, that, that doesn't really... I appreciate that, but I, I completely separate channels is definitely the way to go. Um, but yeah, with the websites, I got heaps of guitar-based websites, and when those opportunities come up, I do plug them on the on the live streams. But I don't just hound people with, "Oh, check out this." Check. I, that stuff drives me crazy. Um, and welcome, mate. Hope you're doing well. <laughs> All right, we got I rocks the blues is here. Welcome, mate. Janice, how you doing? I saw your uh, guitar that you bought. That little resonator thing that was super cool. Well done. I just saw it on uh, Instagram before. Awesome. Um, 
I won Johnny Highland's pinky slide here on YouTube. Oh, that was very cool. How, did he do like a, is that some sort of giveaway on, does he have a YouTube channel? I always see him on like clips on other channels. Maybe I'll have to look him up. I watched him on Michael Palmasano's uh, live stream a little while back. He was having a good discussion with Johnny Highland and that was super cool. But yeah, congrats. Johnny's a great guy, man. Super nice dude. Um, Jody says, could lessons help me? I've never had one and I've been playing since 1964. Wow. So it's up to you. I mean, I, I think everyone can learn something they didn't learn from having a lesson. But if you're a bit like me with stuff and you, or like many other people that play other instruments or you're self-learners or self-taught when it comes to anything, like a lot of what I've learned about other things outside of music was just like diving into it and trying to understand it. So yeah, I think everyone would get less. Um, I think it's going to be hard to get out of some sort of habits when it comes to playing, especially for that a period of time, but you could definitely get a lot of value out of it. It might open a door to something you didn't see before. But my suggestion when it comes to lessons is have a definitive purpose. Just don't let the, the pe people doing the, or the teacher, All right, how about that? Sorry guys, that was uh, li quite literally my camera just uh, turned itself off. It was something to do with the power supplies making funny noises. If it does it again, I'm gonna have to uh, sort that out. I accidentally just kicked the desk and it put pressure on the power supply and then it shut off. I could hear it crackling. I was like, what's going on? Um, so yeah, in regards to the lessons, you got to go in with an idea. Like I want to learn the cage system or whatever the case may be, right? Or you can always find that information online. There's plenty of bad videos, but there's plenty of good ones too. So that can be another way to learn. You don't necessarily just have to be taught something. I'm much more absorbing of information when it's relating to something I'm interested in. So if I went to get a guitar lesson, he wanted to show me something else, I'm like, man, I really want to learn this. Like, teach me this fundamental. Now, sometimes there can be a connection from what you're learning from, um, you know, something else or to something else, but sometimes there's not, and you don't want to waste your time either. But generally speaking, lessons can only be a good thing if you're learning along the path you, you actually want to improve it. Yeah, sorry about the, the audio. Hopefully it's all good. I think I'm going to... um. Stick with the other room from now on. It's much easier. <laughs> um, can't play sli slide to save myself. Feels like a different instrument. I totally agree. It, it is hard. Um, but the more you get used to landing on the frets. I remember when I first started adding slide to some of my videos, it was really bad. Like, And it's still not what I would consider great slide playing, but my consistency with it has improved a lot. I cut a track for uh, a video that's coming up in one pass playing slide. I was like, oh, that's cool. I finally got it. It wasn't the solo part, but just to add a bit of rhythm stuff. That's the texture I really like of slide more than like lots of lead. Um, and that can sound great too if you're good at it, but I, I can't do that. But it is a learned skill. You don't just get good at it. You've got to kind of get the feel for it, understand where you're trying to land. And that can be different because usually when you play a chord, you kind of like behind the fret or between frets or something, you know, when you do like a bar chord, but you've got to land on the fret sort of ahead. <laughs> that can take a bit of time. I'm still no pro at doing that. I, I kind of um, still want to work at it more, but I don't really want to play a lot of lead stuff. I just want to use it as a, as a, like a really great secondary or third track in a mix. That's how I really enjoy it. Uh, Someone says the stacked humbuckers really require updates to the pots. Yeah, if you're going to be using like high output pickups and you've had like vintage style ones, they generally require like 500k pots or higher. Um, it really depends on the pickups. Usually the manufacturers will have information on what 
pots will work best with certain pickups. Um, you can sort of take it from there. Usually there's nothing wrong with adding like a 500k pot to a pickup that wouldn't normally use one. Like if it used the 250, it would just be a lot brighter. So the brightness thing can come from having the right uh, pot in the guitar. There's like a good sort of mix between what's going on there. Um, any preference on the two or six point... Uh, two, hang on, sorry. Any preference on two point or six screw vintage type? Is that in relation to the tremolo? Generally, I found two is better. <laughs> on there's, there's exceptions to it, but um, the PRS one is so much more reliable than the, the Fender one, at least for tuning stability. Um, there's been others that haven't been as good that are two, but they're the, the two examples that, that I can, I think most people will be aware of. Um, All right, hey there, any ideas on replacement bridge pickup for Harley Benton MR Modern? Be interested to see uh, why you would want to change that out. I think their pickups are pretty good. Um, pickup changes, it's, you can't really just say, hey, go buy this pickup. It doesn't really work like that. I need more information. <laughs> Always, like, what do you play? How much gain are you using? All that kind of stuff. And what don't you like about the, the one that you've got in there? I find most of those pickup problems can be solved by using a better amp or even sometimes just EQing the amplifier. I've done, I have made this mistake going down those pickup rabbit holes and changing out pickups and all that kind of stuff. I've done, I think I put three or four sets in one strat that I had and I still wasn't happy. Years later, I had a better amplifier I plugged in with a strat and it sounds great. So um, pickup, unless it's faulty or if it's really nasty and you can't, adjust your amp enough to make that work that's when you might want to change the pickup but um, i would almost take it into a shop or somewhere else borrow a friend's amp plug it in and see if it, you still have those inherent problems plug it into something else see if, see if it's any good um, if you want like a humbucker sized pickup the burst buckets are my favorite I, I think they're really hard to beat i would just go to the, get the gibson ones because they're unreal Ah, okay, Octopus. Very cool. Thank you for the information there on the Johnny Highland thing. Yeah, I kicked the plug. Sorry, I'm just uh, a little bit behind the chat here. Well, I didn't actually kick it. I kicked the desk and it must just be on. Like it's, anyway, that's how we do it. All right, let me scroll down. <laughs> Kicking cords out, yeah. Uh, all right, I'm back. It actually disconnected this. Oh, okay. I have a feeling I don't know what's going on. Maybe the cable that's plugged into the computer is pulling pulling the um the power cord. Okay, I think that might uh, might be actually it. But anyway, all good. Um, I love the cascading trill descending lick you do, Shane. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. That's from Alan. Yeah, I was always like, I never used to sort of get out of playing like straight up kind of pentatonic blues stuff. I then I got really sick of it. And that's where I started getting out of playing some a lot more major stuff, but also playing a lot of those sort of aeolian style licks or, or santana style note choices that just change the feel and that's where i think like the character of my playing changed completely i can still play the straight blues but nowhere near as good as i used to and coming up with different runs up and down the neck that aren't as predictable as the blue stuff was great for my playing and it made me think a little bit differently there's a lot of weird sort of like hammer on stuff i've learned now over the years that has changed the way I would get from, say, the, the third fret to the twelfth. It's completely different to how I used to approach doing that. There's still some of that in there, of course, but I don't just have to rely on that one way. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you. What do I recommend for a hollow body guitar playing rock and blues? Um, are you talking about like a ES335 style guitar or you want like a semi-hollow one? Because if you're going to be playing a semi-hollow one, have a look at 
the GNL Blues Boys. Those things are really good. I, I don't own one. I should have bought one years ago, but they're a great mix of, you get that sort of um, hollow body F hole section on the top, a humbucker in the neck, Telecaster bridge pickup. Pretty hard to beat just in terms of functionality. I think the tone on those are going to be far better than a 335 on the most part. Some 335s can sound great, but if you're in the market for that, I'd almost say, oh man, I mean, Eastman guitars are probably a better value guitar than some, and they sound unreal as well. So um, that would be another one I'd check out as well. Uh, thank you, uh, Bacon Backing Tracks. He says, listen to the tone and playing on the solo of I'd Rather Go Blind, uh, live version of Bonamass Bonamassa and uh, Beth Hart. Okay, cool. All right, I'll check it out, man. Thanks for the thanks for the heads up and thank you for the super chat. I don't I know the song, but I don't know that version. I'm pretty sure it's a, it's a great tune. So yeah, I'll, I'll check it out. I haven't watched probably enough Bonamassa stuff. The, my favorite one of his is actually him playing guitar with Warren Hayes Haynes at the, um, I think it's the Guitar Center Blues Competition or something like that. Man, that those two guys together, Cook, who was great, Bonamassa, um, Bonamassa plays his ass off and Warren Haynes can play his ass off, but he sings so great. One of my favorite vocalists, man. Just, he's got the grit. All right, sorry, let me just go back up here. Um, yeah, sorry about the blackout there, guys. <laughs> um, this is uh, from Christian, he says, do you ever feel like not looking at a guitar? Not looking, like not looking at a guitar, I guess. Uh, I find time away is good for your playing. Totally. You know, after I got back from the US, I was kind of burnt out because all I did was, well, for the first week, I shot 20, videos <laughs> so a lot of those jerry's lefty guitar videos you see them wearing the same t-shirt they're all the same day so um there's a lot of that and i think after going to all the guitar shops and i got back and i didn't really want to play that much so i think i shot a couple of videos then i got really sick and i had some time off and i'm starting to feel a bit more like i've actually been practicing again which has been a, a great thing for my playing um I wouldn't say I'm practicing a lot, but I needed a break from it. And especially like what I find for me personally, especially when you do YouTube and you've done it, I've done it for so long and there's always things coming in or I'm borrowing stuff and I need to do videos. The last thing I feel like doing some weekends is to go play live, which I always love doing. Excuse me. It was, um, it was one of those things where you get sick of it after a while or you get sick of the stuff side of it where you just want to play and it wasn't enough of a balance there. So I'm trying to make, I'm trying to do less just straight up review stuff. I actually want to put time into practicing or time into going to play live more coming up. That's going to be part of that goal because that's why I started playing guitar. It wasn't just to make videos. <laughs> it was like that was, this was a side thing that turned into my job, but uh, yeah, I, I totally, totally, I understand that time away from anything's good. doesn't matter what it is. Even if you train, you go to the gym, you do whatever you need a downtime from it. Right. So make, makes sense. And you also have to keep mo. I think the older you get, one thing I've noticed is it's harder to keep the fire in your playing. It really, it really does affect that side of it. It's like you go from wanting to really, like my, my, my mindset with guitars completely changed to like playing live. I was trying to push for that. Now it's just like my challenge is to record something in a video that works well for the video. And then I'm happy with that's my creative outlet at the moment, which might not be enough. So yeah, it's definitely, it's, you know, it's like anything. If you work with a certain type of thing all day, you come home. The last thing you want to do is have that sort of, thing follow you home kind of thing so yeah I, I totally get it i think time off from it is definitely good and uh thanks again uh bacon uh tracks i appreciate it oh jonathan that's i got another pop up here far out um <laughs> 
Jonathan says, felt like I've been free riding off your great content for years. So here is a small token of my appreciation. Cheers. Hey, thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, mate. I appreciate it. Um, I wouldn't do this if I didn't like it. But like I just mentioned, sometimes you do get a bit over doing guitar stuff time and time again. Look at like some of the other channels, man. They're pumping out two videos a day. Like, how do you do this? It's so like, it's full on. Because for me, I, I, I like to, I'd rather put out one or two between one and sort of like three videos a week where I, I'm not just doing it all the time, but what I release is up to my standard of production. I like the production side of it. It's part of my nerdiness. And um, but there was a time, man, where I, I was just, I got so many videos on the channel now. It's crazy. I, it really, I look back and I, it's kind of shocking. I can't believe it. <laughs> but uh, hey, mate, I appreciate it. And I tell you what, I should be super chatting you guys because, uh, you know, you, Without the views, without the subs, without all the comments and that, the channel just wouldn't get found. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Alan says, I think Righty Ben has some really cool and kind of quirky licks that I really dig. He's a monster player. He's done the music school thing. He's a gigging musician and he understands the theory behind everything. <laughs> Unlike me. So yeah, he's, he's a monster player. He was great even when he was 16. I knew him back then. So, um, yeah, he's a serious player, like really great. And he's got his tone sorted and yeah, there's a lot of good stuff. Um, Jody says, going to see Bonamassa in Pittsburgh on March 1st. Very cool, very cool. Um, which of these, in your opinion, have a better out of the box bluesy sound, Vox AC30 or PV Classic 30? All right, without pedals, Classic 30. With pedal or with a tube screamer, I would take the AC30. Vox have this really scooped mid thing that I don't love and they're very bright, but if you put a tube screamer on it, it's the tone. So if you've already got a pedal, the Vox AC30s are brutally heavy, whereas the classic 30s aren't. So you also got to decide about that. Um, I think the classic 30s are way more versatile in terms of the gain structure. And they've got two independent channels that are a lot easier to switch between. Whereas the Vox has that top boost thing in the in the normal channel. Um, if it was me buying a Vox, I'd buy the AC30 S1 with the single speaker. It's not as heavy. It's plenty loud. Same basic EQ curve as the classic AC30, but um, works great with pedals. I've played one. They're, they're really good, but you've got to sort of tame the top end. Um, so that'd be sort of like... My suggestion that the classic 30s are good, that they're a good solid amp. They don't really blow me away in terms of their clean or their drive channel. But if it was, if I was just using an amp for a gig, I'd probably use that unless I had my pedal board. Hope that helps. It's a bit of a strange answer. I watched an interview of Tommy Emmanuel and he was told he was learning songs from the radio and he didn't know that there was a bass, so he learned to play the bass <laughs> and guitar parts together in one. Yeah, totally. I mean, I've watched some of his uh, interviews too. He's talking about when he was learning the Chet Atkins stuff, not knowing that he played with a capo. And he said something like, he couldn't possibly be playing with a capo because of who he is. And so he learned to play it with all these crazy chords. And uh, yeah, he, he's like, when he finally got to play with him, he's like, put the capo on and starts playing. He's like, oh. <laughs> so yeah, Tommy's got a lot of good stories, man. He's a, he's a monster. If you've ever seen him talk about his hands, you probably notice like his thumb extends like, like this. <laughs> he's uh, over the years of playing and forcing his hand into certain positions. He's actually kind of almost like mutated his range of movement here so much further i'm just looking at my reference monitor to make sure it's in focus here so much further than you can like move it at all like it's crazy he can it just goes like burp, right out here like kind of like michael jordan's hand it goes right out yeah he's uh he's got some pretty pretty funny stories um i can never uh be a music oh it's this oh sorry hey thrash metal studios here sorry he says I returned my DSLR 40C and traded it in for a uh, Fender Hot Rod Deluxe 3. <laughs> the Fender rules. Any upgrade suggestions to it? So many great speakers for those amps. I actually like the Eminence. Um, sorry, the Celestion A-type speaker that's in those. I think they're really good. I would put a Swamp Thing speaker in that 
and you get the Fender tone, but you get more bottom end and just an overall bigger sound. It's it's unreal. And you'll like it too, even with high gain. The Swamp Things have just a really great sound about them. Um, did you have the CR or just the C? Because the CR and the C are two completely different sounding amplifiers. Um, I remember I tried the DSLC, the older version, and I didn't love it. But when I tried the CR and I finally got it cranking, I was like, this is pretty good. I'd be interested to see what what happened because uh, I, I really thought you were going to dig that amp. That's super, oh, I, the hot rods are great too. So well done. Uh, uh, Jody says, could never be a musician professionally. I have to feel like playing. I don't see how professionals do it night after night. Oh, you got yeah, you've got to really love playing. I mean, for me, doing gigs at one point wasn't it wasn't a job. It was like doing this. <laughs> this is this isn't a job. This part, but just the whole. For me, making videos is fun. I much prefer doing that over other things, but sometimes it can feel like a job, but when you're playing music and you've got friends around you and stuff, it doesn't really feel that much of a chore. You kind of just enjoy it. The thing that sort of sucks about gigging, sometimes you play at a venue and the, the PA system's awful, you can't hear yourself or you've got no space and the audio sucks and there could be all these other factors or there's someone drunk screaming in your face to play a song that you, you'd never want to play in your life. Those are the things that can ruin the gig, but the playing aspect of it, if you're playing the music you enjoy, it really doesn't take much to enjoy that. The biggest thing that sucks is when you do a gig and you cop a parking fine or there's like, you know, you've got to drive an hour and a half or that's not fun. And I just stopped doing all of that kind of stuff years ago. I only wanted to do gigs that were local to where I am because it was easy and fun, much more fun than driving an hour and a half across town. <clears throat> Uh, Cowhide Music says, Classic 30 was my first tube amp back around 1996. They're very cool. You know, I bidded on one on eBay about a year and a half ago. And there were two of us bidding on it. And I found out my good friend Dave, he was the one who won it. We were bidding against each other and didn't even know. Otherwise, I wouldn't have, I would have let him have it. But uh, yeah, they're good. There was a like a limited edition black one that is very cool. They're good amps. They're solid. Like they, they got... You know, like this is the thing with them. The Marshall Drive Channel is so much better than most amps for what I play. You just turn it on, it sounds unreal. The Fender Clean Tone is iconic because of how much better that is than a lot of other amps out there. The, the PV is somewhere in the middle. It's not as good as the Fender. It's a bit like Yorkville Trainer amps. And the Drive Channel is not as good as either. Or, you know, being that it's not as good as the Drive Channel and the Marshall and the clean isn't as good as the fender so it's somewhere in the middle but it's got its own thing going on it kind of kind of does the the business it gives you a pretty decent sound <clears throat> dennis says so ready to see some more live playing shane thanks man there is some clips coming up i've got we, we jammed for a few hours there's some really good moments i've done all the audio uh we used the the switcher so it's all ready to go which is good i've got all the video file there i just need to sort of like put it into a actual context. I use this amp back here, this Hageman amplifier. This could be amp of the year. It's unreal. <laughs> so stay tuned for that video. I'm gonna, I'm like halfway through putting that video together. I really want to put in a bit of effort for it because I had to showcase it at its best. That amp is unreal. Um, Silver says, no question, Shane, just my compliments on your rise to I'm um, no world-class guitarist, mate. Thank you. I might be kind of known online. <laughs> it's a very big difference between that and being a, it's a, you know, like look at Johnny Highland, but I, I appreciate that. You know, the guys like that are on a whole different level. I, I just do my thing. My skill set is weird. I'm like, a, I'm a bit of a nerd when it comes to tech. I love playing guitar. I might not have the chops, but I got other things that kind of well, I can play okay with certain styles of music. Obviously, I can't play metal very well, or if at all, and there's, I can't jazz much, but uh, yeah, the kind of weird niche the channel's in kind of works, and thank you. I appreciate it. Actually, I've got to ask today, a guy from, I think from Nashville, he's looking for um, some guitarists that are a bit different to play on some, some recordings. I said, yeah, I'm interested. Let us know what it is. It'll just be like a, a tracked part, but maybe I can record the process or something. We'll see how we go. I watched a video interview with Tommy Emanuel. Oh, that's I already read that. Sorry, I'm a bit behind. Oh, I am really behind here. Sorry. 
Um, Fat says, welcome, mate. He goes, uh, I've been hesitant to leave comments uh, recently because of all the scams on YouTube. I wouldn't worry about it. I always say to channels, anytime they have problems with it, block all the keywords that are in those comments. You never see them. You know, I think I copped it again after months and months and months of not having those comments. They changed their what they were basically saying. But if you block a few words, it all goes into spam. So don't worry about it. They'll, they'll sort it out. Uh, your review of the 68 Custom Pro Reverb sold me on it. It's great practical live uh, pedal platform. I've kind of really appreciate appreciate its size and weight, not having to lug a huge amp around. That's from John. They're awesome. Actually, my good friend Brian just bought one. He had it over here last weekend, and it sounded unreal in the like little recording thing we were doing. So, yeah, great amp. He waited six months or more for his because the back order was so long. But, uh, yeah, one of the best new amps that kind of have that retro vibe going on there. They're super cool. Uh, uh, there we go. Nix for Life says, I practice with a Vox Pathfinder. I want to buy an EL84 amp. Those um, Vox Pathfinder amps are unreal. They had one called a 15R that had a little reverb tank in them. I watched this guy play with one of those through a 2x12 cap. It was a two, Fender 2x12 cab. He was powering full-blown, like a 2x12. I know I just said that a few times, but it blows my mind. A Vox Pathfinder powering a 2x12 box. And it sounded so good. <laughs> this was a this was a long time ago. The 15Rs are discontinued, I'm pretty sure. I haven't seen them for years. But they're great little practice amps. Really cool. So his must have had some sort of like, you know, speaker output, 16 ohm output on it or something. But man, super Cool little speakers. EL84 amps are, if you want to get that sort of really bright, sort of chirpy sound or a fairly aggressive sounding drive channel, they're, they're great. Ah, uh, Thrush says it was the C version and it was cool, but the volume drop between the channel switching. Oh, okay. Wow. Well, that's a that's a shame. Yeah, the C, I, I, I've never really noticed any problems with like dropping... I think if I switch channels on my amp, you hear it kind of change. It's not like super smooth, but it doesn't actually like have any issues with dropping volume. I use the effects loop with delays and stuff and it works great. So anyway, the, the Fender amp kicks ass. So well done. That might be a good idea for a video chat with Ben, see what gear he uses and what music he plays so we can all get to know him. Yeah, I mean, I just threw him into the deep end. It was like, all right, well, I've got a month. I need to queue up. 20 videos, what, what, I need some help. So yeah, he just jumped in, man. I said, don't, don't get disheartened by people go, who the hell is this guy or <laughs> whatever. The idea was, was to do a, like a podcasty kind of thing with him, but it just never happened. So yeah, we'll get him back around at some point. Yeah, k -san, that's someone's, yeah, that's the bloody song. So if you ever heard people scream out, um, what's the one in the States? Uh, Freebird. K-San is like the, the song that no muso wants to hear anyone yell out in, from the crowd. Um, Porkchop says, hey Shane, any chance you could do a small guitar, guitar search Saturday at Deluxe Guitars? I know the store isn't big, maybe you can combine it with another small store. Oh, that would be great. You know, I actually started talking about that idea because I used to go there all the time at their old store. I've not once been to the new one. I'm not on that side of town that often, so I don't get down there much, but... Um, the owner's a really nice guy. They got some really cool stuff. So I'd, I'd actually really like to do that. It'll happen at some point. I still got two that I need to finish um, before I want to shoot anymore because the next two are the like really big ones. <laughs> and uh, yeah, after that, I'll, I'll definitely get down there at some point. I, I'd love to do that. I also like to visit a few of the first 10 that I did undercover with a crappy camera and all that kind of stuff. I want to actually do those again properly because they could be so much better now. Um, Jody says, have you experienced solid state amps that just cut out in the middle of playing? I had a Vox Hughes and Ketna Fender side between the solid state amp cut out. Nah, never. It sounds like, um, maybe the, the power cable's bad, you know, or something like that. They can't all have the same problem. So I found at some venues, the power boards where you think you're plugged in, much like what happened before, any slight 
vibration or movement on the power board where you plug in can cut them out. And if the same amp, if different amps are having the same problem in the same area or the same room, that would be my guess. Power boards at venues suck. I always bring my own now because doing a gig, you got to have stuff that works. And there's so many where that you think they're in and that any any slight movement, that connection breaks. Just exactly like what happened before. Um, uh, Greg says, are you in a band that plays live gigs and travels? I don't really do a whole lot of gigs now. The band that I've got, <laughs> if, we're, if we get invited to do something, we'll do it. Um, but it's it's not like I'm chasing gigs. I just don't have as much time to put into doing that anymore. I don't enjoy the whole process. I did that for so long, like going to venues and meeting people. A lot of venues either, it's weird. I, I think for the kind of music I want to play too, it's not something that everywhere will want to do. And I don't want to accommodate and I shouldn't, you know, I should just do the gigs that are fun for me. So we occasionally do like a New Year's Eve thing. We'll go have a big jam. It'll be a mix of friends as well. But then there's also maybe once every, well, it hasn't been for the last few years, but we were doing like a, a festival once a year around the same month. And that was just without rehearsal, just we knew what we were playing and we went in and did it. Um, but no, the, the short answer is I'll play with a, I'll do a gig if it shows up, but I'm not going to be doing like any interstate travel or anything like that. I just don't really want to do that anymore. I gig so much back in the day that that whole th doing that is a full time job. You know, there's some guys that are great at doing the chasing, the calling, and uh, it's just, it's not fun. I'd rather not. So I still love playing live. This is the benefit of the blues jams and the open mics and all that kind of stuff. You can go there with friends, the same guys out of the band as well. Go have a great play with no expectations or commitments and then hang around for a bit, have a meal and leave. <laughs> it's a lot more fun for me to do that. Uh, it just takes all the complication out of it. And you know if the venue's open that it's on and you can have a great shot. So that's kind of where I'm at now. I love playing live, but... Yeah, the days of chasing gigs, I just don't have time. I'm trying to manage a few other things and just this channel as well. So it's kind of not something that I'm that interested in doing anymore. But I've played live a lot and I still play live, but just not in the same capacity with the band. Um, because I always think if you're playing like original musical blues, you have to keep the catalog moving. You can't just be doing the same stuff for years on on end. So many blues bands like that. that I call them the suicide blues bands. You turn up. And, you know, 10 years might go by and they're still playing the same, you know, handful of songs. And it's like, oh, man, really? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of, like, writing music as well. And if I'm not writing, I feel like I've got nothing to share. If I'm just playing the same songs I played 10 years ago, that's not really a great gig for the audience that remember all, some of those songs and myself because it's, like, not really a challenge. So there's... Being gig fit is very different to just playing guitar at home. Uh, it's, it's two completely different things. You got have to sing and have the independence with the guitar. And you have to sing it at a level that's at least good enough to get by. Otherwise, it's you, it's a real struggle. <laughs> um, let's just have a quick drink. Back on the Pepsi Max today. I've got some caffeine on the floor. <laughs> All right. Anyway, that was a bit of a long-winded answer. So, um, yes, I still play live, but not. I don't chase gigs anymore. If they show up, we'll do them. But it has to sort of work with the ease of the situation now. I, I, I don't want to spend weeks trying to book a gig. It's just no fun. Uh, have you tried Found Sound for a guitar search Saturday? They moved back. They moved. They have moved to Brunswick now. Ah, okay, yeah, yeah. Now the story's big. Looks like uh, now the story's big. Looks like Seven C Music. Man, I'm fumbling over my words reading this stuff today. Maybe it's the fatigue. <laughs> um, yes, that would be great. I didn't know they moved. I did one at their old shop years ago, so. I'll just call them. That'll be the easiest way. So yeah, I can definitely do that. Maybe I can knock that out the same day we do the deluxe guitars one as well. 
if it works out that way. Um, I always like their shop, the swap shop as well. Both have really interesting and great stuff. <clears throat> Thanks for the heads up, man. I'll, I'll just make a note of that into the into my little notepad here so I can check out everything that people mention, like the Joe Bonamassa, um, Beth Hart, Rather Go Blind. All right. Uh, I've seen your visit at that store as a Blues Brothers fan. Have you seen Guitar Murphy's video? It's the guy that plays in Aretha's... Oh, Aretha's husband. Um, have I se seen his videos? No. That's pretty cool. Wow, this is this is great. This is a great tip. I'd love to check that out. Thanks for the heads up. I'll make, the, make a note of that as well. I haven't seen any of his videos on YouTube. I didn't know he, he had any of that stuff. But there you go. Very cool. I love that movie. It never gets old. You know, I had a... I don't think I've got a Blues Brothers poster anymore, but I did have one for a while. But it was um, back before, though, when I got them printed and laminated, they were really reflective, and I don't think it stayed very long because of the colours. But I've got a few others that I, I'd like to get printed up. I got I should get that done. That'd be great. Um, yeah, thanks for the heads up on Found Sound. I'll definitely get into that. Uh, Wayne says, hey, Shane, I'm just about to level a fretboard. Love your show. Thank you, Wayne. I appreciate that, mate. All the best with the job. That's super cool. Good friend of mine, uh, Brian's just getting into doing all of his own fret work and all that kind of stuff. He's kind of always been great at tinkering with pickups and, excuse me, the electronics. And I think he got on the Stu Mac and got all the stuff that he needs to get the frets a certain way that he likes. So it'd be interesting to see if I get a text message saying, the guitar survived or, or <laughs> oh, I screwed it up. So we'll, we'll see how he goes. Dave says, gigging small venues only seems to get more difficult for less pay, LOL, and trying to make a living. It, it is extremely difficult. Yeah, I, I think I gigged as a full-time musician like three times a week, which was all I could do playing the music that I wanted to play. Two or three times a week, so Friday, Saturday, Sunday kind of thing. Um, not every weekend either. Sometimes it was other nights of the week, but... I knew early on, I was like, I have to do weddings. And I hate going to weddings. So there's not a chance I want to do this full time. It was just not an option. Um, so gigging now and for a long time has always been supposedly fun. And when the fun left it, if we were going somewhere too far or we did a, a charity gig and we got some sort of you know, parking infringement notice or whatever. So it's like, Man, this sucks. <laughs> so yeah, I only do stuff that makes all that process very simple and fun and easy now. I don't want to be involved in uh, making it complicated or... Because you feel guilty. You play for three, four hours and you give your drummer 50 bucks and that's all you get as well. It's like, man, some some gigs I used to pay the band with what I got as well. I was like, here you go. Because <laughs> it was so bad. But it, it is what you play and where you play and all that kind of thing. But I just think the treadmill of gigging is pretty tough. You've got to really commit to it and you've got to also have something that makes people want to come back. And unfortunately, I think a lot of music, a lot of bands just don't have that it factor. If you see them once a year, it's different. But if you're really going hard, you have to have something that a lot of people don't have. I just don't know if there's enough of that really kicking around. <laughs> Catologist says weddings beats funerals. Yeah, totally agree. I don't know if there's too many uh, gigging funeral bands out there, but I tell you what, I did one gig at a wedding and it was the only gig I ever did. We had to get there to the, this is probably just normal too. We, we had to get to the venue before everybody showed up to set up and we had PA system and everything. It was, an, it was like an eight or nine hour day. We did three sets of music, which was like three hours. And it, we, we had to wait until people cleared out to get half this stuff back out. It was a huge pain. It, it was just not worth the time and effort. And it was, it just wasn't fun. That whole environment is just terrible. All right, we'll get you to get everybody. We need you up in a few minutes. It's like, all right, great. Thanks for that. Yeah, I don't know. Gigging at, at weddings is like... It's like a nightmare for me. 
if you're in a rock and cover band and you love that music, then it's probably a lot more fun. But yeah, I don't like playing that sort of stuff. And welcome, mate. I hope you're doing well. <laughs> uh, any su uh, suggestions for a lefty short scale bass? Oh, I did play one recently. You know, I've got an Ibanez sound gear that I love. Uh, is it out? Why is nothing out when I want to showcase something? Anyway, I don't know if that's necessarily, it's not a short scale actually, but the, the neck is actually quite a lot thinner in terms of its width than a lot of say like a P or a J bass. So it's a lot more comfortable to play. And if you're a guitarist, getting over to that is pretty good. I know that Fender make a couple of those little shorter scale bass guitars. A good uh, mate of mine's got one, but I don't know what model it is off the top of my head. So uh, I'm not too sure. Um. <laughs> I don't uh, trust anyone else to perform at my funeral, so I've taped this VHS. Oh, there you go. <laughs> uh, uh, Thrash Metal Studio says, and shame we should team up for a metal track and you have to shred. See, this is the thing with me. I, I can't do any of that really great sweeping stuff that I see players do that are right into that music or any of that tapping stuff. I, I can't really do any of it. I just butcher my blues hybrid kind of stuff that I play. But man, I like all kinds of music. I'll listen to it. I, I love heavy music. I just, I'm not all of it, obviously, but I, I still listen to stuff and the artists that I was listening to when I was younger. That's the thing. I don't think I ever got out of those um, particular bands, but either way, like it's uh, definitely a fun style of music. I, you just don't want me ruining your album. Trust me. I bought an SR650 based on your Ibanez bass. Love the neck. There you go. Cowhide says it right there. Great guitar. Those sound gears, man. They're hard to beat and value as well. I got mine used. It was basically... This lady, I got it. I actually purchased it off. She bought it right before she was having a kid and never played it. And it was just sitting there. So I got it for like... She said $120. And I said, I'll give, give you 150 bucks. And she goes, oh, is it too cheap? I said, meh. For it is secondhand technically, but it had plastic on the covers and everything. So I gave her a few extra bucks. It came in a gig bag, and I still got it. Right before that, oh, not right before it, but um, years before that, I had a Squire PJ, which are actually pretty good basses as well. Like they're a bit harder to play though in terms of the action. There's something pretty great about those Ibanez sound gears, just in terms of playability. On the live clips that we're going to showcase coming up, there's a good mix of like. I'm playing bass on some of it, Rick's playing bass on some of it, and Brian's playing bass on some of it as well. So you get a good chance to hear a couple of different bass guitars in the mix too. But the Ibanez are awesome. They've got good pickups. You've got an active circuit that's actually pretty musical. It gives you more clarity and more low end instead of just uh, like farting out the low end, which can happen on some, some active uh, pickups. Does anyone have a VCR? <laughs> uh, you know, I've got one in a box somewhere because sometimes I'm like, you know, tech changes, and I was like, one day I've got to go through and like get all this VHS stuff off, um, off VHS onto the computer. And I did that, and I kept the the old Sony stereo VCR from from years ago. It's somewhere here. It, it, those kind of weird little things always come in handy sometimes. It's like, oh man, oh there's that tape. You know, time to get it onto the computer. I've still got all my first, the first time I ever played live. I've got on. Um, VHS so I have I did import that to the computer years ago but it was before like all of that stuff got way better <laughs> so I'm going to try and do it again at some point um, is there a funk blues genre yet yeah that's what we used to play in the band pretty much was like a funk version of blues or a funky blues that's my that's my bag the funk blues stuff is my is the most fun for me um Oh yeah, so 150 for a sound gear. This was basically like the SR150, my one is, I think, and it's, I think it's basically like an entry level bass, but it does the job. And being that all I do on bass is basically play here, uh, doing all my little intro tracks and stuff, that's what I use it for mostly. It does the job. Having anything like bigger and heavier and more professional for me with that isn't really, um, isn't really, uh, required anymore um hmm. 
looking at a VC, <laughs> looking at my VCR right now. See, there you go. People still got it. A lot of people who are into like movies won't ever get rid of their VCR because the argument is that there's so many videos catalogued on VHS <laughs> that you just can't buy on Blu-ray or DVD even. Even though DVD's got like, or had, you know, just a massive amount of, of the catalog available. There's still so many movies that never made it. So yeah, I know a lot of, I watch like Red Letter Media. They've got like a lot of um, really bad videos in their collection, but lots of stuff you just still can't get on any other format. So yeah. Yeah, it's funny. Uh, Guitologist is just mentioning. Oh no, sorry. It's Chess Roots says I just bought my first last VCR when they were new, eight hundred and seventy-five dollars. <laughs> you want to know something bad? So when I turned thirty, I bought a fifty-inch plasma TV. It was in Australia at the time, which was dollar was still not as good as the US back then, but um, it it was twenty-seven hundred dollars, so two thousand seven hundred and fifty bucks, basically. I think six months later, I went back and it was like 1100 bucks, exact same TV. So that, that $875 VCR now. <laughs> Actually, who knows? Maybe they're still worth something. Maybe you just can't get them anywhere in good condition. So, but yeah, I know the pain involved with uh, spending too much money on stuff that isn't, um, you know, it, it just doesn't hold their value when it comes to tech. Oh, that's funny. Um, I still have my go-to player v VHS and DVD. Far out, man. That's from Matt. Awesome stuff. That's that's the combo that everyone wanted. <laughs> a VCR and a DVD player built in. Thing would be built like a tank. Remember those old VCRs? Mine's like a front loader. <laughs> so you pop it in and the cassette sort of drifts in silently and goes down. There used to be these ones you used to click the top up and they used to pop up those old, like, they remind me of those American cars that had the wooden panels on the side, you know, back in the, the Chevy Chase Lampoon's Vacation kind of vibe. And then you like clunk that thing down and, oh man, there that, that was some uh, pretty mechanical looking devices back then. You know, when I first went to the States in 1999, the car I got picked up in was a was one of those Chevy Chase or Chevy Chase uh I don't have National Lampoon's car. I don't even know what it is. It's just like those wooden paneled cars. I was like, oh, <laughs> they exist. This is awesome. Uh, <laughs> uh, the tape disintegrates. Yeah, look, over time, absolutely. That That's the biggest problem with any of those analog formats with the exception of like records, I guess. the They just don't have the, the shelf life and longevity. Remember when everyone said that CDs would have a shelf life of a hundred years. I don't think that's true. I think that was like what the assumption was about them. But I watched this really interesting kind of like micro documentary on different platforms. There's a really great YouTube channel that has all this stuff. He talks about mini disc, which was a really good format as well. Back in the day, mini disc was something that I used to use all the time for my band. Like I'd bring a this little square mini disc player, pop in the the disc that was in like a plastic cartridge, which was great because then you don't actually like get the disc scratched or anything. And then I used to have this little stereo microphone that was attached to it, hit record and record the band. And that sounded great. It's pretty much like what good camera equipment sounds like now. So you get a good stereo mix. It would auto adjust the levels or you had manual control over it as well. But yeah, as you, if you look up mini Sony mini disc or mini disc, format on YouTube. There's this one great channel. It's had a lot of views too. You'll see it. It's got like millions of views. That channel goes through all the old antiquated tech and, you know, talks about the pros about it, what, what went wrong with it and all that. It's really interesting stuff. <laughs> I have one of those top loaders somewhere in the garage. That's hilarious. Did you, you did a video about like repairing one, right? Am I, am I imagining that? Did you do like a VHS repair video? <laughs> I had a, I have a feeling I, I remember seeing that pop up. What about the TVs with the DVD player built in? You could get, <laughs> you could get buff lifting one of those, man. Yeah. These are the tech, you know, right before flat screen or even plasma came out. I remember having one of those. I bought an almost flat screen CRT television, man. 
it's funny, like looking back at photos of your house or your room where you've got an old TV set up. It's like, oh yeah, wow, they used to look like this. You know, I got a little um, a Mac screen over here, but behind me on this side, I got two flat panel monitors for doing all my YouTube stuff. And it's like, I save so much space. <laughs> Yeah, CDs are about 25 years. There you go. Yeah, that makes sense. Because I remember hearing something. I couldn't remember the exact uh, figure on the life expe expectancy of it. But yeah. Hey, we've got uh, String Grip here. Welcome, man. Sorry if I didn't say hi before. Hey, we've got Big Cloud is here. Uh, 3D TVs was the biggest scam, though. Yeah, I don't know if... 3D sort of comes and goes every 10 years. In every format, you'll find, like... People were pushing like 3D at the cinema with those glasses that give you some sort of like, what's that condition? Yeah, it's not good. <laughs> and basically they give you a headache in five minutes and then the tech got better with the TVs, but then they disappear because no one cares. No one's going to be buying 3D stuff because it just, and, and they also had, I think as well, 3D Cam Sony released 3D camcorders, and I think they just tanked as well. I haven't seen those again for you for a long time. James says mini disc was awesome. I, I totally agree. Mini disc is unreal. Hey, we've got DMS Productions here. Welcome, mate. How you doing? Um, never did VHS, but I have a lot of vids on channel two. I taped off old VHS tapes. I have, but I have ah. Maybe I just saw one pop up in the feed and I, it looked, may have just looked like your thumbnail. But um, I remember, never did, never did a VHS. Okay, maybe I'm imagining something. I, I do remember seeing something quite fairly recently in the feed, but it might've been from another channel. Uh, your repair videos are awesome, mate. So good stuff. My CD collection is still going strong. Oldest CD purchase is in 1990. That's from Chopper. Very cool. You know, the first time hearing a CD player through a decent sound system, I was I was shocked. You know, not hearing any of that sort of static background hiss crackle from what you would hear on other formats. I remember um, this has gone back a long time. I don't know how old I was, but I was a teenager hearing Michael Jackson's jam. And at the start, I think there's a, a window that shatters or something, or someone throws a bottle at a wall or something just goes... I was like, whoa, it sounds so... I couldn't believe how real it sounded. I was like, this is amazing. The first CDs I remember hearing was that. Dangerous album and also Brothers in Arms by Dire Straits. Still one of my favorite albums of all time. Um, I like this. This has gone off, gone right off into, um, <laughs> into a whole other area of this live stream. This has been fun. How long have we been going for, by the way? Let me just quickly check my uh, my thing here. Uh, I don't see a time. Why can't I ever see time on this thing? What, what did we start at? 1.30. So it's just been just over an hour. Okay, cool. Uh, but I tell you what, Thrash Metal, if you want to, if you want me to noodle over something on, a, on an album or on a recording, let us know. I'll be happy to contribute to that. I probably need about two weeks. I, I've got a video I need to have finished tonight for tomorrow on my other channel. <laughs> and uh, that has to go up at the point of release. That's, yeah, it's just the way that that kind of works. But um, yeah, anytime, I've got a, a little bit of a backlog, but any anytime after about the next week or two, I should be caught up. Um. Yeah, there we go. Thrash Metal says, my late father-in-law has over 4,000 VHS tapes. We're starting to go through. I found Cobra and the original Hitcher. Wow. Man, that was, that was the days, huh? Good old VHS going to the, the video store, getting the great action or, or crappy horror movie. It's good times. All right, I'm just scrolling back down here. Sorry. I, um... Uh, look at the video I just tagged you on Instagram. You need that guitar. I will check it out. Let's have a look. Oh, actually, I can't share this. Uh, can I share this? Let's just have a look. I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it. 
on my phone, wherever that is, after the fact. It's going to be easier. I'll, I'll check it out. Thanks. Uh, CD is far superior. Shane, the video. Oh, sorry. Yeah, okay, cool. Consider it done. Uh, 19 days before the day I was born. Ah, okay. This is from, what, what is it? I don't even know what that is. AGFA. How do you say that? Edge? Is it just Edge for or something? I, I don't know what that is. $50 late fees <laughs> from Blockbuster. <laughs> yeah. Well, back in the day, right? Like this was, I think, the part of the problem. They used to have to spend a huge amount of money on just getting one cassette. Like there were, it wasn't just like it was, you were buying it privately. I think the business law, at least in Australia, I'm pretty sure like um, Blockbuster and all those video um rental places had they were paying like eighty dollars back in the eighties for, for cassettes, not ten bucks like you could get them from the shop, right? So yeah, I think there was something to do with that that cost a fortune for for them. And maybe if they thought it was lost, that's where you I don't know, late fees suck. <laughs> maybe it was some sort of like missing in action fee. Remember that movie? All right. Um Oh, Justice for All. I was like, what the hell? I uh, didn't you know what that was. Gotcha. Um. <laughs> Blockbuster went out of business because of my unpaid late fees. There's still one left. I watched the video on a channel called Cinemassacre maybe a year ago. And there's one left in the US. I thought that was pretty funny. It's exactly like it was. You, it, It's hilarious. So... Now they're back to it being an independent shop. <laughs> it's funny that they just ended up like all this video on demand stuff just took over the world. Imagine if, you know, the hindsight things kind of makes things easier to work out, but you know, they could have probably have done something similar as a massive chain instead of just like disappearing. And all of those streaming services end up coming and going too. I wouldn't be surprised if like, you know, Netflix was going up and up and up, and now they're sort of coming down and down and down. So then there'll be lots of other options. I'm not that much into like video on demand services, but yeah, I just, I don't know. I don't watch as much stuff anymore as I used to. Hey, thank you, uh, Swank Daddy. I appreciate the super chat there. Thank you. Two bucks. So thanks, man. Thanks for the support. Yeah, documentary. It's in Oregon. Yeah, it's on uh, the Cine Massacre YouTube channel. Yeah, I think the documentary might be called The Last Blockbuster or, or the something like that. It's pretty cool. All right. Back in the 80s, I lived in, uh, is it Bahrain? And I used to buy bootleg Betamax movies for 500 of that currency, is it fills? Is that, is that uh, about 25 cents in the US? Wow, there you go. Yeah, Betamax was a format I never had. It was VHS or bust. Actually, when it came to camcorders back in the day, I used to have, what was the first? So there was the VHS, the large ones. Then there was like a, a small version of those made specifically for camcorders. And it wasn't a digital tape. That came afterwards, but it was like a smaller, compact version of... It looked it looked more like a VHS tape than a Betamax tape, which had, I think, one circular part on it. I, I can't really remember. But anyway, it, uh, yeah, it went from that. Then it went into those little digital tapes, which you can still buy today. They're kind of like a conventional tape-looking thing for video, but they're... Um, the quality was awesome. And they were the first of the digital tapes. It still had all the inherent issues when it came to long longevity, I guess. But yeah, I had one of those and then it went into this uh, SD cards and never looked back. <laughs> it's so much easier now. I remember back, even when I first started doing YouTube, I think I had that old camera from, I had it for years, the one with the tape. And it was like getting this to the computer via Firewire was just a horrible experience. It was just not good. It's changed so much for the better. I mean, your phone can take some of the best video you can get. Like people use them because uh, they use them for all kinds of things on YouTube. There's a channel that doesn't invest in any camera equipment other than a, than a phone. 
and the results are like stunning. You get good lighting, phone's great. You know, I use the phone a lot for walking around while we're away because the stabilizer is so good. If I forgot the GoPro, I was like, I just use my phone. Looks looks unreal. Looks like it's almost on a gimbal. So yeah, there's lots, of, lots to like about the uh, tech these days. Eight millimeter, there you go. Eight millimeter was a, was that also in a cassette form? I know 8mm used to be something else, right? Oh, no, you're right. Actually, yeah, I think you're right. Thank you, guys. <clears throat> cinema on demand, so there's an entire history of great cinema you can't see on the big screen. And that'd be cool. So theaters will crowd for viewing, for viewing of specific titles that people vote on. That's a great idea. You know, in Australia here, just actually not far from where I am, there's an old school, like really retro, like 1960s style cinema. It's been going for years and all they do is replay the classics and every week without fail if the blues brothers is on everybody's showing up they got the costumes on you know john landis was there uh the producer or, or director of that movie and we were there the night he showed up to sort of check it out it was like man this is so super cool i i that's a great idea nothing wrong with going back and oh yeah why don't places do that that or more or at least broad scale wise um, <laughs> some funny comments today if, yeah, if I spent 50k on some company named Microsoft instead of buying a hose in 1993 yeah yeah I totally get it um, Chris says oh sorry I missed the ritual of going out and picking up a movie or heading to a record store checking out the import uh, section uh the use of to oh the youth uh, I guess of today have no idea what they're missing. Uh, get off my lawn, yeah. <laughs> it was fun, yeah, absolutely. I I totally agree. Um, it was a VHSC with a smaller cartridge, same thickness tape, and then it was a smaller format with thinner tape in it. Uh, okay, maybe that's what I'm thinking of because it yeah I know in one of them, I think it was a man, I had so many different camcorders I used to get them used for as cheap as I could find them, you know, secondhand or whatever. And they'd already been bad shape, but I'd, I used to love like just filming whatever. And then I'd use them until they just don't work. And that's when I used to do the upgrade. They were the smart days back then. But one of those had the um, slightly smaller version of that VHS tape. Maybe it was called C here and then also uh, Super 8 somewhere else. It, it, I wouldn't be surprised. Are there any DVDs that that are of a concert you were at thin lizzie and the sydney opera house in 1978 was one that i was at that's awesome paul well done man um no no i haven't been to that many big shows and the ones that i went to i don't have any uh, they weren't filmed at least not not to my knowledge anyway so no the one i would love to have had on like a produced video was when i first saw dr john its rhythm section was so good you know, if you don't know Dr. John, he was uh, one of the best New Orleans, well, New Orleans piano player. And, and he got really, he's, got, he's got a really unique vocal and he was always different to everything else at the time. I remember hearing him on a syndicated radio station here back in 1999. I was like, this is great. Like, it sounded nothing like any of the other songs on Triple J, which is the radio station at that time. I don't listen to them anymore, but I remember just thinking to myself, why does that sound like better than everything else that they've got at the workplace we're at? I, I, you know, the radio was just on. I was like, I like this guy. And the guy I was working with was an older dude. He's like, oh, I know who that is. I've got his first, one of his early albums. And he gave me his album. And that got me into Dr. John. And he was always like, you look at what the Beatles were doing, which was great in its own way. Then you look at what Dr. John was doing at the same time. And it's like funky. It's got groove. It's like right out there. It's completely different. And, uh, and that's kind of what got me into that kind of music. And when I saw him live, the rhythm section was so good. Like, it, it was it was unbelievable. The drummer just comes out and starts laying down groove. Bass player comes out and just, they were killing it. I, I wish that was on video. All the videos I've seen of his shows that just pop up on YouTube, they don't really capture the vibe. And it was such a great show. So, sadly, no. <laughs> Um, 
Mac Rebanak. There you go. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that was his uh that was his normal his real name, I should say. There's so many old movies I'd like to go see on the big screen for the right price. Yeah, I'd love to see some old school 80s stuff. Even earlier some of it as well, but it'd be great to see Actually, I probably could make that effort. Like I said, the cinema that's not far from where I am. Well, it's not cl super close, but they do sessions where it's just like classic movies, but you want like the great back-to-back. -back. You don't want to just be into one, but paying for two kind of thing. But yeah, I could, I might have to start looking into that. I haven't been to the movies in forever. Um, <laughs> Smokey and the Bandit. There you go. There's another one. Uh, for some reason, Dr. John reminds me of Captain Beefheart. I don't know who that is, but uh, in looks, you mean. Okay, I, I don't know who that is, but Dr. John was, uh, and he is one of my favorites. I I was buying his CDs on import. I liked him, his music that much. I was like, this dude's awesome. Uh, we might wrap this up pretty soon, guys. Thank you so much. I'll try and timestamp this. I'm going to call this the VHS uh, Chat of the Gods or something in the uh, in the title. <laughs> reminiscing about uh, the good old days. We all sound old once we start talking about VHS. It's, um, you know, it is what it is. But I'm in my 40s, so I guess I am kind of getting old now. But yeah, every, everybody, thank you so much for the support with the live stream and all the videos I've got. I know, again, I haven't started doing a lot of the new stuff I want to film here and, and release. I'm kind of getting through the backlog, but it's not far from, from coming up. I'm sort of going to get ahead of the release schedule, not schedule, but the release videos. Usually I'm like a few days or a week or two weeks ahead of what you see. I'm not at all at the moment. <laughs> so uh, you hang in there. I've got some cool stuff. Again, this amp that's back here, this Hageman amplifier, one of the best I've tried of all time, especially if you're a strap player. I can't wait to see what people think of it. It was like shockingly good. So, um, and we tried it live with the band, so we, I know exactly how it sounds, both in context and just sitting around. All right, guys, take care. Thank you so much. Hey, Buzz, welcome and uh, goodbye. <laughs> thanks for all your support too, Buzz. I appreciate it. Uh, DMS, thanks for hanging out, man. We've got, uh, thanks, Guitologist as well. If you don't know his channel, guys, go check him out. His repair videos and all that kind of stuff are informative and interesting and makes me feel like I don't know squat about electronics. It's great. I like that feeling. It's good. It's humbling. <laughs> all right, guys, take care. Thank you again for, for all the support. Sorry if I'm a bit out of it today. I'm uh, trying. <laughs> it's been a, late, a long couple of days here, but uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to sharing some new stuff and some new videos coming up pretty soon. So hang out for those and I'll catch you soon. So yeah, how do we do this again? Oh, yeah.